Just so I don't leave you in the dark, I'm going to be in Proverbs chapter 11. How many of you have plans for next week? Some of you have plans for next week? How many of you know what's going to happen next week? We live in a, in a world and we live in a life that is uncertain. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on today in, um, not Proverbs, but Ecclesiastes chapter 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many of you went to Proverbs? Okay, good. Well, go a little further and get into Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Uh, the same person who wrote many of the Proverbs also wrote Ecclesiastes. And uh, he shares his wisdom with us in chapter 11, gives us some principles concerning dealing with the uncertainties of life. And the very first one is, in verse 1, Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. Now, there are three possible interpretations of this. <clears throat> the, the old, one of the oldest and uh, most frequent is that this has to do with almsgiving. I, I don't agree with that, but at least that's one idea, that, that if you give to others, you will be blessed in return by getting back. And that's a, that's a possible application, but uh, I think uh, there are other more uh, salient uh, interpretations. The second one is literally, cast your bread upon the waters. Of course, uh, if you do that, bread usually <clears throat> dissolves in the water. And uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure that's exactly what uh, Solomon meant either. Uh, the old New International Version that I read from says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. But the new New International Version... The 2011 version puts it this way. Ship your grain across the sea. After many days, you will receive a return. And I really think that's, although that's not literally what he says, I believe that is the best understanding of what he meant because this verse 2 also talks about investing. <clears throat> so in verse 1, Solomon is saying, if you want... A, to make a return in life. If you want something in return, you have to first make an investment in it. We used to put it this way, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And so if, if we want to see something happen this year, in our lives, in our church, in our work, in our homes, in order to make a difference, in order to see something happen, we're going to have to make an investment. When you're making an investment, you need to understand that how you invest and in whom you invest those are very important things. For one thing, uh, for instance, I'm at the end of my life, right? I mean, I'm getting closer to the end. Now, unless some of you take me out, um, I hope I have a few more years of life, but I'm just saying, uh, I was listening to Andy Stanley this morning, and uh, he was talking about your life as a story. You're writing a story <clears throat> as you live your life. 
At this point in the story, in my story, it's too late um, for me to start my, uh, my career as a forward for the Celtics. I, I think I've let that ship sail. Uh, it's probably too late for me to start my political career, you know, run for the White House. Although our president is fairly old. He's, what, 70-something? <clears throat> but there are a lot of things that it's, it's too late for me to, to start uh, reinventing my story. My story has a line. It's a storyline that I've been following for 45 years. Um, and uh, now I get the opportunity to write the last two or three chapters. When you get my age, <coughs> when you're reading a book and you're following a story, those last couple of chapters are really important, aren't they? How you end the story is important. I mean, how many of you have been frustrated by a book or by a movie because you follow the story and all of a sudden the last 10 minutes of the movie or the last couple of chapters of the book <clears throat> left you just feeling confused or dissatisfied? Or it's like it just kind of ran out of steam or didn't make sense. You don't want your life story to end up that way. I don't want mine to end up that way. So those last couple of chapters are crucial. You, how do you write your story? One day at a time, Justin. Now Justin's young, so hopefully his book is just beginning. It's going to be an interesting story. <laughs> However it works out. <clears throat> but I'm just saying, whether you've got a lot of chapters to write or a few, you write those chapters one sentence at a time, one paragraph at a time, one day at a time. And then, if you don't like the way your story's turning out, if you don't like the direction it's going, what do you do? You need to do a rewrite. You need to take a turn, make a change, right? This young lady down here has made a change, a big change in her life. It's never too old. You're never too old to start <coughs> rewriting your story, start a new chapter. But you're going to have to make an investment. And I'm, I'm going to say something to you that I'm going to be telling the board in greater detail. One of the things that we fail to invest in enough <clears throat> is our relationships. <clears throat> when we talk about investment, and Jesus did, he said, uh, he told a story about uh, three guys. One had five talents, one had three, and one only had one. The one with five invested and earned another five, right? One invested three and got... Another three. Well, what did that one with only one talent do? Went and buried it. And Jesus says he would have been better off just going and putting it in the market somewhere <clears throat> and earning a little interest than to bury it where you can't use it. We need to be investing our lives in what's really important. To us. And by the way, it's not just about money. It's about our time. It's about our energy. We're investing those things. The question is, are we investing them in things that are valuable, that are important, that will yield a return? One of the things we need to invest in here is people. We've got buildings now. We might need more buildings, but, but, you know, furniture can't do anything for you. We've got an altar. We, we spent some time and energy getting the altar, and I'm glad we did. But the altar alone can't do anything for us. 
The building can't. Where, where's the greatest return? Where can we invest and see the greatest return? It's in friends, family, neighbors, work associates. What was that you said over there? Somebody said something over there. People. <coughs> it's important to cast your bread upon the waters. It's important to make an investment because if you don't invest, you won't receive anything back in return. But it's also important in an uncertain world where you're not always sure <coughs> where your investment's going to pay off. Verse 2, give portions to seven, yes to eight. For you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Uh, the new New International Version puts it this way. Invest in seven ventures, yes, in eight. In other words, <clears throat> we used to put it this way. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. In other words, diversify your investment, your portfolio. Make sure you're investing in a number of things because you don't know which will pay off the best. And since he says, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land, don't count your chickens before they hatch. So uh, we need to understand in an uncertain world, <clears throat> we need to pour ourselves not just into one thing, but into several things and see what God will use to bless and to return to us. The second principle is found in verses 3 and 4. If the clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where it falls, there it will lie. <clears throat> so there are some things in life, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Anybody else struggling because of the weather? Well, no, Kyle is. Where's Kyle? This, oh, there he is. He's over there nursing his, and I'm here nursing mine. There are certain things in an uncertain life that you can count on. When clouds are full of water, it's going to rain. Where a tree falls, we don't know where it's going to fall, but once it falls... We know where it's, where it's lying. So we need to observe how things work in life, right? And to observe the things that we can count on. But there's a danger here. Verse 4 says, Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. There are some things we can count on, but we still live in an uncertain world. And if you're constantly waiting for a sure thing, you're going to be frozen. You're going to be so full of fear about doing anything that you do nothing. You can't afford that. <clears throat> you can't afford to live hoping that you'll find the sure thing and then you can go with it because it won't come. Sheila went after me, but I wasn't a sure thing. But I got you. <laughs> better or <for> worse. <laughs> and now she doesn't know what to do with me. There's nothing that's sure, and so we need to learn to live it by faith and not in fear. Then the, the third principle is found in verses 5 and 6. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And get used to this. There are some things in life, we know more about the mystery of what goes on in a mother's womb. 
but we still don't understand everything about it. There are mysteries in life, there are mysteries in the world that you're not going to understand. Get used to it. Learn to live with some mystery. Learn to live with not knowing everything. Sow your seed in the morning, <clears throat> verse 6, and at evening let your hands, and let not your hands be idle. So in uncertain times, even though we don't know everything, that doesn't keep us from being diligent, does it? We need to be diligent to do something. Sow your seed in the morning and at evening. Do not let your hands be idle. <clears throat> Make sure you fill your life with work. Again, if you sit back and do nothing, what are you going to get? So don't be idle. Don't waste the time that God's given you. For you do not know what will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. So again, you have to be diligent. You pour your work in. You don't, you don't always get what you expect out of your labors, out of your investment. I remember one year my dad planted tomatoes, and we had a drought in Arkansas. And those tomato plants just shriveled up, turned yellow, and died. And my dad decided that wasn't good enough. So we went back and we planted another 300 tomato plants. <clears throat> my dad was determined to get tomatoes that year. Those died. And you know what my dad did? went out and got 300 more tomatoes. We planted tomato plants three times that year. But my dad was determined we were going to have tomatoes. You don't know what's going to succeed. You don't know what's going to happen. But you can't sit back. Listen, how many of you think that your life story is going to be written without you being involved in it? You're just going to sit back and let your story write itself? Is that the way to do it? No. <clears throat> and most importantly, and I'm going to end with this, if you're going to write your story, make sure that it includes being a part of God's kingdom. What are we supposed to put first? Okay. Seek first the Amen. kingdom of God, Matthew 6, 33. Now, that doesn't mean reading your Bible all the time or praying all the time. <clears throat> Although, praying without ceasing can be done anywhere, anytime. Doesn't mean coming to church seven days a week. The church is a part of the kingdom, but so is your family, so is your job. Everything you do is kingdom work if you do it for the glory of God, if you do it to seek to benefit others and to serve God, your life can be about the kingdom of God. But in order for that to happen, you've got to think about it. For instance, ask yourself, if I put the kingdom of God first, what does that mean for my family? What would my family look like if I was putting God first? What would my work look like if I was putting God first? What would my church look like if I was putting God first. What would my life look like if I'm putting God first? Now I can tell you if you're writing your story today and you are when people are reading it they ought to see the kingdom of God in there. 
But I can't tell you how to write that in. I can only tell you, <clears throat> as you write your story, that needs to be a big part of it. And you and God have got to figure out how to write your story so that it happens. Sometimes it means changing jobs. Sometimes it means changing priorities. Sometimes it means focusing in different places in your life, different areas of your life. But when it comes down to the end of your life, and you stand before God and He reads every chapter of your life, Is he going to be pleased with the story that he reads? Hmm? Is he? If you're a young person and you're asking yourself that question, that's good because you've got a lot of time to make some changes and rewrite some chapters. Some of us, we've got to be very careful how we write these last chapters because we won't have time afterwards to rewrite them. Let's pray.